Hello, hello, hello. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much for asking. It's lovely. Uh, uh, I had the good fortune of working like, what, 10 feet away from while Django was being done, and so it was lovely. To me, it was like a, a wonderful tool. The moment it was there, I was like, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do this? Can we do that? And I'm sure I annoyed the heck out of the people who made it, but it was lovely. Uh, so, uh, yes, Lawrence. Greetings from Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, why Lawrence, Kansas is essentially, that's what Jeff asked me. It's like people see the LFK hashtag. What is it about Lawrence such that here is where uh, Django might have been created? And I'm going to submit that you already know more about what's come out of Lawrence, Kansas than you probably realize. Uh, it was started in the midst, uh, at the beginning actually, before the Civil War, Lawrence was. Uh, quick history, Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, Congress said you can be a new state and people on the ground are going to vote whether or not you're going to be a slave state or a free state. So the New England Emigrant Aid uh, Company, I love their sign there, up one flight, that should be a motto for something. Um, uh, they funded people to come to Lawrence. Lawrence is named after uh, Amos uh, Lawrence. Massachusetts Street uh, is named after his home state. Uh, here's a funny, uh, it's not funny, uh, it's an interesting little uh, poster. It looks like sheet music, I think. It's something telling people that this is a song. And scholars now believe also it influenced the, uh, the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So it's pretty fascinating. This is the man himself for whom our uh, city is named after. Um, again, it was, it was in the middle of uh, what were, was to become the Civil War. The Civil War started here. The Civil War actually, elements of it, are within 150 feet of we, where we are right now. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is what they thought we were doing, forcing slavery down the throat of uh, free soilers. Uh, uh, the Sack of Lawrence, 1856. Um, this guy, he's later, he's a, he's a reb who came and burned the, the place down. Um, but uh, uh, Lawrence became, what was going on in Lawrence became the Civil War. Um, the Sack of Lawrence was intended, one of the intentions they had was destroying this newspaper's office, the Herald of Freedom. You might have seen a plaque right uh, on the corner of this building. Uh, this is where the Herald of Freedom uh, published. One of the things they wanted to do, and they did do when they came and sacked Lawrence, the Missourians, and to this day, you know, I don't know personally, I'm not a fan of Missourians, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you can't get over that slave stuff, right? Uh, it's hard. Uh, so they came into town. They wanted to burn down the city, which they did. They burned down the Eldridge Hotel. I don't know if anybody's staying there. It's right over there. Uh, and one of the greatest stories about this is they took the printing presses from the Herald Freedom and dumped them into the river right down the way. The townspeople went and got the type, the lead type, from the printing press and turned it into bullets and cannonballs and fired it back afterwards at those people, and they would say, here comes another edition of the Herald of Freedom. <laughs> Astounding. So here's some images of, this is the Sack of Lawrence. What were they trying to do? They were trying to burn the abolitionist newspapers and shut them down. They were trying to kill the uh, uh, male uh, residents so that they couldn't vote to be a free state. Here's a lovely little shot, too. Uh, it's hard to see a lot, but Liberty Hall, that's where we are. That's the big building. Uh, uh, in the center of the photo, and that's one of those lovely imposed photos showing where the Herald of Freedom was. Uh, this is what was left of Lawrence uh, after they burned it a couple times. Um, John Brown, another person uh, you might not have heard of, uh, but you've certainly heard of what uh, the effects are in terms of like the American Civil War. Uh, here's a uh, fascinating, oh, that's the wrong photo of him. Uh, that's. That's in the news center. That's a lovely little thing. Hopefully, it's right over here. Hopefully, you'll see it. This is a very famous painting of him. Uh, he's, yeah, he's a, he was like, no slavery. So the Civil War, that's what it led to. Um, let's see. Uh, some more things about Lawrence. Uh, this man on the right is named George Walker. He's right there. This group, this duo right here, are the first African-American media superstars in the United States. Uh, and he was born in Lawrence. He's buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. He isn't, uh, which is what way? That way. Um, 
He's not recognized yet. Uh, I just learned about this guy Thursday, uh, and actually we're going to talk to some people and see if he can get uh, so that people will know he's here. Um, they were a vaudeville troupe. They had the first black production uh, of a Broadway show. Uh, in this guy's, in the guy on the right, uh, George's house, if you've ever heard of uh, Langston Hughes, they used to, in uh, the apartment in New York, they used to get together. Langston Hughes uh, grew up in Lawrence as well, uh, had a lot to do with the Harlem Renaissance, if you've never, if you're many people familiar with the Harlem Renaissance, it was a movement in the 20s uh, by African Americans, I would look it up. It's, a, it's another way that Lawrence has impacted things. Uh, another fun one, this guy's actually a Canadian, but we don't talk about that. Uh, that is uh, James Naismith, the inventor of basketball. And what's lovely is, and he came here, and in fact, that's, isn't that like, what is that, Fraser Hall behind him there? Something like that. Uh, in Lawrence, they still hadn't figured out the rules yet for basketball, so it was seen as kind of like a thing for couples to do out on a date. That's, <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, <laughs> that's his wife there. So basketball, I mean, the rules to basketball are still in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, uh, it's a multi-gabillion dollar worldwide industry now. Uh, just another thing to show, it's like what happens when you bring transplants to Lawrence and let them do cool things. That's one of them. We wouldn't have Will Chamberlain without uh, Naismith coming to Lawrence, which means we would not have Michael Jordan. Think about that. Just let that, you know, without Lawrence, Kansas, and Roy Williams admitted this, because, well, he didn't admit it. He, he brought, uh, uh, he was helpful bringing uh, Jordan to North Carolina, but then when he came here, he kind of validated the whole thing. Something you might not think about, too. Uh, there was a movie filmed here in, uh, at, that was shown on TV in uh, 1983. It was called The Day After. Are you familiar with it at all? Um, that's a nice little slide from it. That's like on the highway looking towards Kansas City when they blow up Kansas City. Uh, uh, here's a lovely shot. It's a still, I think, from the production. And this is two blocks. That's 9th Street. Um, it's a funny thing, too. You see the, the column right there, the white column? You can see that the window is still in the... Uh, I'm sorry, the glass is still in the window there. That's because the guy was like, no, you can't ruin my store. So there's been an explosion of an atomic bomb and the glass is still there. Maybe that, uh, maybe that actually would happen. Uh, so the night uh, before the movie aired, it was uh, screened for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The director recalls, I had somebody I knew in the room who said, if you thought they were going to snicker or pick it apart, you were mistaken. They sat there like they were turned to stone. This is the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, watching the movie. Uh, the director goes on, the making of the film was to date the most worthwhile thing I ever got to do in my life. Any movie that the President of the United States winds up saying changed his mind about the idea of a winnable nuclear war is not an insignificant achievement. I would agree with that, wouldn't we, you know? Uh, the Reagan administration came in thinking, and this is a historical record, they came in thinking about acceptable numbers of nuclear casualties. Uh, his memoirs reveal what he had to say about the effects of what the day after had on his thinking. And then uh, later on, uh, when he signed uh, the Intermediate Range Weapon Agreement in Reykjavik with Gorbachev, uh, the director got a telegram from, his, from the administration that said, don't think your movie uh, didn't have any part of this, because it did. So that's kind of astounding, really. It's like a movie set in Lawrence. All sorts of locals took part in it. Uh, it was hugely uh, important. Uh, another thing. Uh, another little Lawrence, Lawrence export, uh, Bill James, I don't know if you've heard of him. He, uh, he invented essentially uh, uh, what they call money ball, right? Saber metrics in baseball. Uh, he went on to uh, help, I think he first worked with the Red Sox, but the whole idea of looking at stats and how you buy uh, uh, players, how you contract with players and everything, completely changed the nature of baseball. And of course, without Bill James, we would never have uh, uh, Nate Silver, so... Imagine that world. Um, it would be a sad world. Uh, Lynx was developed here. When was that, 1990? Yeah, you remember that, when you would fire that up? Does anybody remember testing websites in Lynx? For, yes, <laughs> sweet. These two guys, sorry? I don't, no, do you? <laughs> yeah. um, let's see, so that was 1992. Uh, let's see. Uh, which gets us about to the time, and I'm stealing this photo too, where World Online. Uh, 
Now, the, the company, uh, the, the world company owned a cable TV franchise in town. They had gotten into that in the 60s. I think one of the Simons is the, the, uh, uh, the owners of the company. And as an aside, too, I forgot to mention, uh, one of the Simonses came into Lawrence at around the time of the Herald of Freedom and all of that with $50 in his pocket, the story goes. He made a newspaper, uh, and over time, it's uh, now the journal world. They, the company was really astounding. Uh, Frank will attest to that. Uh, uh, they had a cable franchise, which gave them a boatload of cash, right? It really did, and it funded so much. It, also, it, it allowed a newsroom to punch way above its weight by hiring, uh, you know, the likes of these guys. Uh, here's the entire team at, does anybody know what year this was? Does anybody, I don't know. I mean, Bill Sneed, a photographer for the Journal World, a famous, uh, lovely guy, took this a long time ago, and there's all sorts of great people. Adrian's in the back, all sorts of people. Simon, you might have been gone by then. Uh, but Rob Curley is... Did he? I, my memory is hazy. So long ago. Um, uh, so it was. Uh, so the company had a history of innovation. When I started working there, there was a guy named Ben Singer, who was, uh, as I understand it, one of the first people to be doing Mod Pearl. Isn't that right, Frank? And Frank, you came to work at uh, the Journal World so that you could see his code, uh, which was great. Frank and I go way back there. Um, so there was a lovely tradition of. Uh, kind of like not knowing what was going on, but just throwing money at it, you know, to let people do stuff, <laughs> right? Am I wrong? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, people didn't know what was going on. Nobody knew they were, <laughs> Adrian was off at his house making Django, what would become Django? The publisher, the Dolph, the publisher. Yeah, Dolph Simon's uh, senior, I believe, or junior. Yeah, Jude, because three is the next down. Yeah, yeah, he's in his 90s now, and he would still write his, uh, on the typewriter, it was wonderful. Um, so we had a great history there. Uh, Ralph Gage needs to be really powerfully name-checked as well for what led to the development and the environment that led to the development of Django. He was the general manager for a long time. Uh, I had a great, long uh, experience working with him. Not always great. Uh, dude was, like, intense, you know. <laughs> he was a great... Uh, he was, well, let's just say he was a great guy. He hires Rob as well. Rob Curley comes. Rob uh, heard of Adrian, and I'm not really sure how, and maybe this will, if, Simon, if you're doing Adrian, uh, you were at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, weren't you? And you did not have access to the, you, they wouldn't let you put your files, you didn't have FTP access, did you? Yeah, he was a programmer and couldn't have server access. I mean, so that's what, like, how some people were thinking, obviously, and Rob was like, screw that. And I remember him talking to me and saying, hey, this kid's like from, he's like from outside Chicago. You're outside Chicago. Why don't you talk to him when we come hire him? Maybe, maybe that'll do something. I don't think it did. But he did come. And then, you know, the parade of uh, excellent names, Adrian, Simon, Jacob, Matt, Wilson, Dan Cox needs to be uh, uh, name checked as well for that. So it is absolutely fitting uh, that we're gathered here 10 years later in Lawrence, Kansas to reflect on Django which was first envisioned and put to use in a basement of an old post office maybe two, three hundred feet away um, from where we're sitting right now. So just to get a sense of that, right there is where we are. Oops, sorry. Uh, can you see the little green dot? That is Django official green. That's where we are. Uh, that's where Django happened. That's where... Uh, during the Siege of Lawrence, that's right outside. If you would go outside and look into the intersection, that's where cannons were firing at the Eldridge Hotel to destroy it. Um, right there, uh, which is right probably 150 feet that way in the middle of the street, John Brown uh, exhorted all sorts of people to uh, uh, protect Lawrence against the pro-slavery people from um, Missouri. So. We're in a pretty historical area here, so it's absolutely not surprising to me that uh, why Django happened. The last thing is, you might have seen like the whole LFK. Uh, that's what it really means, can you see that? <laughs> that's, that baby did not invent it. I wanted to give absolutely a special uh, shout out to the woman who did coin it, because all sorts of people have stolen it from her. Her name is Leslie Kay, she's a local Laurentian. 
Uh, she does screen printing and stuff like that. She coined and made those first shirts that look like this that say Lawrence fucking Kansas. Can I say that? Sorry, you can beep it out. <laughs> My bad. Uh, say, say what? Okay, cool, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and LFK, which is lovely. I mean, I, f I don't remember what it was for the longest time, but it, I, we would probably put hashtag Lawrence if we were at the news, right, and wanting to say something about uh, uh, what was going on. Now the newspaper itself, they use LFK. <laughs> I love it. To, you know, to, as a tag. It's lovely. Uh, so, I mean, that's a, uh, hopefully what you get out of this is go, if, if any of the names you remember or anything like that, go look them up. Lawrence is an amazing place. It always has been, hopefully always will be, so it's absolutely fitting that you're all here because of Jacob. Cheers. Sweet. <laughs>